I got a question for you guys. If your family moved into a house with an evil swimming pool that was haunted by an ancient demonic spirit, what would you do? I just gotta know. You see, this pool can grant you your deepest desires, but every wish comes with a deadly price, and there's no way of telling when your next swim could be your last. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the evil pool spirit in Night Swim. <laughs> This family is about to be in deep trouble. Back in the 90s, this young girl Rebecca wakes up in the middle of the night when she notices something strange. Looking out her bedroom window, she sees a toy boat that belongs to her sick brother Tommy floating in the middle of the family's in-ground pool, even though there's no one around who could have put it there. Going to his room, she promises her brother that she'll go get the toy for him, and sneaks outside just as her mother is sending the kid's nanny home for the night. But that was her biggest mistake. Outside, Rebecca finds the toy in the water, but now it's floating all the way down at the bottom of the pool, so she quickly grabs the skimmer and starts trying to fish it out. It's difficult for her to reach, forcing her to lean further and further over the edge, until suddenly an unseen force pushes her head first into the water, sending her crash to the bottom as she struggles to get back to the surface. Looking up, the girl sees a vision of what appears to be her mother reaching down to help her, but when she finally makes it back above water, she realizes that no one is really there, and she swims for the edge, but just when she's about to climb out, her brother's boat toy suddenly rises up behind her. Thinking it over, she nervously decides to give it one more try, but every time that she's about to grab it, the toy floats just a bit more out of reach, luring her farther and farther away from safety. Suddenly, she's violently pulled underwater, and it looks like there's a shadowy figure watching her from the edge of the pool. The girl screams for help, but nobody comes to save her, and whatever's attacking her drags her down until she completely disappears into the water, never to be seen again. Okay. It looks like poor Rebecca here just took the last swim of her life. There's no way that she could have seen this coming, but the truth is that her death could have easily been prevented. And the blame falls mostly on her parents for not taking the proper steps to make sure that their kids were safe. After all, with one of their kids already on his deathbed, you'd think that they'd be a little bit more serious about protecting their only healthy one. Swimming can be a fun way for kids to get exercise and build some confidence, but as we've just seen, being too careless about safety is a quick way to get them killed. In fact, a study from the CDC found that an estimated 3,500 deaths occur from drowning in pools every year. And of these, approximately one out of every five victims was a child aged 14 or younger. An unattended child can easily drown, especially if they aren't a strong swimmer. There's also the risk of becoming trapped by the suction created by the pool drain, being knocked unconscious in a fall, or being shocked by electrical hazards like those flashing lights. At night, the low visibility and inadequate lighting can make it even more easy to become disoriented in an emergency. Even for adults, swimming alone can be surprisingly dangerous. A sudden medical emergency or unexpected injury can quickly turn bad, and without anyone around to help, the risk of death increases dramatically. So, whether you're just a kid like Rebecca or a full-grown adult, it's always safest to at least let someone know that you're planning to swim, have a phone nearby for emergencies, and avoid risky behaviors like diving or overexerting yourself if you're swimming alone. If you have a child in the home, making sure that the pool is safe is extremely important, even without some kind of evil spirit lurking below the surface. Some steps that you can take include installing a safety fence around the pool, placing alarms on the doors leading to the backyard, and getting a pool cover or safety net that can at least support the weight of a child. You'll also want to get a cover for the pool drain and keep toys like Tommy's boat away from the area when they're not in use to prevent kids from wanting to get too close. Never let a child swim unsupervised and have a sincere conversation with them about why it's so important to never go anywhere near the pool without a trusted adult, especially at night. There's no denying that all of this would have made Rebecca much safer, but by the looks of things, this was no accident. From what we've just seen, 
there are a lot of telltale signs of what we could categorize as demonic activity. First, let's consider the target. The spirit chose a family that was already in a vulnerable state because of their sick son, and went after their only healthy child while the parents were nowhere to be found. If the mother and father are also struggling to cope with their son's sickness, this could make them emotionally vulnerable enough for the demon to manipulate them and create an opportunity for it to target Rebecca here. Then we have its method of attack. Demonic spirits will often use something familiar and comforting to the child to get them to let their guard down. In this case, it used her brother's toy boat to lure her out. We can see that the boat was behaving strangely as it floated to the surface and then back down again at will, and kept inching its way farther into the deep end as if it was being deliberately manipulated by the evil spirit to lure her in. When the spirit is present, the pool lights flicker on and off, which is another sure sign of demonic activity. It also appeared to the girl as a vision of her mother pretending that it was trying to help her. And you might be wondering why it would do this. Well, demons take pleasure in making their victims fearful, showing that her mother was there to help only to then take that hope away, plus the flashing lights leaving her in the dark, are two things that a child would probably be very afraid of, and it wanted to make her as terrified as possible before attacking. Now with that being said, this could also give us an idea for how to fight back. It seems like it takes a while for the spirit to build up its power, so as soon as you notice strange things going on, maintaining your composure and getting out of the pool right away could be all that it takes to save your life. One thing's for sure, whoever moves into this house next should definitely invite a priest or two over for their first pool party. Hopefully the next family member has better luck, but later we're gonna find out that there's more to this accident than we might think. Many years later, this former baseball star Ray and his family are shopping around for a new house after he was forced to hang up his jersey when he was suddenly struck with a career-ending illness. Driving through the neighborhood, he watches all of the other families happily playing out in their front yards, and that's when they spot a place that looks absolutely perfect. While his wife Eve is getting a tour of the inside, Ray wanders out back and finds the now overgrown swimming pool. It looks like it hasn't been used in years, but he's wanted one ever since growing up, and something about it makes him feel like this is definitely the house for them. That's when he notices an old baseball that's just floating outside of reach, but when he reaches over to grab it, he suddenly loses his balance and falls face first into the cover. His family rushes over to help, and they're relieved to see that he's okay, but they have no idea that this pool is going to be their worst nightmare. One afternoon while fixing up the pool, Ray here reaches down to clear out the clogged drain. When he suddenly slices his hand on something sharp, it's a nasty cut, and as soon as he pulls his hand out of the hole, a bunch of disgusting brown sludge comes flooding up from down below. They end up calling in a pool guru, who explains that their swimming pool is actually fed by a natural spring from somewhere deep under their backyard. Later that night, Eve decides to go out for a quick dip in the pool to clear her head, but this night's swim is about to be anything but relaxing. While swimming a few laps, she suddenly sees a vision of her husband standing at the edge of the pool, but of course when she looks again, he's nowhere in sight. Confused, she starts treading water while looking around the yard, and that's when the pool lights begin flickering on and off. Eve wisely decides to get the hell out of there while she still has the chance, and as soon as she does, the light magically starts working again as if nothing was wrong. But her instincts are telling her that there's something strange going on with this pool. Back inside, Eve stops to check on each of the kids and finds them both safe in their bedrooms fast asleep. Ray is out cold too, but he wakes up as she's staring at the pool through their bedroom window. Concerned, Eve decides that they should install a pool cover for safety and check on the lights, but lets it go without explaining what got her so freaked out. It looks like everyone's safe for now, but their cat Cider is still out by the pool, and that's when the toy boat rises up to the surface. A moment later, the lights suddenly cut out, and the poor kitty disappears without a trace. In the morning, the only thing left of Cider is his collar floating on the surface of the pool. The rest of the family members search for him around the yard, but there's no sign of their feline friend. And inside, Ray notices that the wound on his hand has somehow completely healed up. 
Okay, this family needs to be careful because it looks like whatever got Rebecca is now coming after them. Although the evidence is certainly starting to stack up, no one in their right mind is going to immediately jump to the conclusion that their pool is haunted by an evil spirit. First, let's look at any more logical explanations that could explain what they're experiencing here. That pool guy was a bit of a nut job, but he mentioned something important. Instead of filling up from the municipal water supply, this pool is fed directly from a natural spring. These occur in underground areas where special types of absorbent rocks, such as limestone or sandstone called aquifiers, collect and store rainwater that filters down through the soil above. The weight of overlying rock layers puts downward pressure on the water, which then finds a path of least resistance where it shoots up to the surface again, creating a natural spring. As it turns out, the neighborhood is near a geographical region called the Driftless Area, where the underground geological formations create special conditions, making it possible for natural springs to occur. Talk about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. In order to feed a pool with spring water, you need a pump system that draws up the water from the spring and maintains a constant level in the pool. This means that if they decide that they need to stop the flow, compromising the pump system would be a great place to start. Since they're getting their water straight from the source, one potential explanation could be that it's coming into contact with contaminants that are causing them to hallucinate. For example, a highly toxic compound called methylmercury is created when naturally occurring mercury comes into contact with bacteria in sediment and then is absorbed by aquatic organisms like plankton. Human contact with methylmercury can result in severe health effects, including hallucinations. There's also the chance that these visions are being caused by pesticides and herbicides used for local agriculture, or even toxins produced by certain varieties of algae or fungi. Nobody wants to hear that they're being poisoned by their pool, but if this is the case, then the good news is that the solution is fairly simple. They'll want to test regularly to make sure that they're maintaining proper chemical levels, including pH, chlorine, alkalinity, and calcium hardness. They'll also want to make sure that their filtration system is working properly and be sure to regularly vacuum the pool. These simple steps can reduce their exposure to any contaminants, and hopefully they'll stop seeing visions of shadow men when they want to go for a swim. Now, logical explanations are always the best place to start, but we the audience know that there's more going on here. We can see that the spirit is using the same strategy that it did to get Rebecca on Ray, Eve, even the cat. It lured them in with something that they want. Ray wants his baseball career back. Eve wants some time to relax. And the cat was just interested in the boat. This means that if I saw $1 million cash and a pepperoni pizza floating around out there, I'd know to stay the hell away. They really need to start talking about the strange things that have been going on before it's too late. For Eve, her husband says he was never out by the pool, but she knows damn well that she had a vision of him, or something pretending to be him, plain as day. It's also interesting that the creature chose to go after the cat first, because in many ancient cultures, cats were believed to ward off evil spirits. And it's as if the demon is systematically breaking down barriers to get to the family. Put all this together, and it definitely seems like something supernatural must be going on here. It's time to go on the offensive before this spirit gets any more powerful. A pool cover is a good place to start, but if they really want to cut straight to the source of the problem, then I'd suggest getting a paranormal investigator, medium, or priest involved right away. The family eventually ends up installing that pool cover, but the very same night, Eve has a horrifying nightmare of herself drowning after being caught underneath it. She jolts awake at exactly 3 a.m., but quickly notices that her husband isn't in bed with her. That's because Ray here is out in the pool swimming laps like a maniac, and something about him out there sends a shiver down her spine. Ray has now become a man obsessed with swimming, spending more time in the water than he does on dry land, and his power level is increasing with every lap. After returning home from school, his son Elliot finds him in the garage bench pressing 365 pounds for several reps without even breaking a sweat. The kid wants to play a game in the pool where they dive for quarters, saying that his mom won't let him swim alone, but Ray gives him permission as long as he stays in the shallow end and promises that he'll come join him in a 
a few minutes. While Elliot here is underwater playing with his action figure, someone comes along and chucks a quarter into the pool. But when he looks around, you guessed it, there's nobody there. A little confused, Elliot puts on his goggles and dives under for the quarter, but more and more of them start falling in as he does, luring him farther and farther out into the deep end. One of them falls directly onto the drain, and when Elliot swims down to grab it, a strange voice calls to him from somewhere out of sight. This time, when he looks up, he sees a vision of a young girl standing at the edge of the pool, but when he gets to the surface, she's already disappeared. Elliot dives under again, coming back up below the diving board. Suddenly, the board starts crashing as if someone was about to jump, and he has no idea that a mysterious figure is standing on it right above his head. Just then, he starts hearing the girl's voice calling out to him from the skimmer, and he sees his action figure floating inside. The girl tells him that her name is Rebecca, and she says that she needs help finding her mom. Confused, Elliot reaches in for his action figure, but when he pulls it out, it's caught in a huge clump of disgusting hair. Suddenly, a hair-covered arm reaches out from the darkness, grabbing Elliot by his wrist, but he manages to pull away just in time, and some kind of strange, demonic creature descends back down into the water. Terrified, Elliot runs inside to tell his mom what happened. She storms into the yard looking for the intruder, only to find nobody there. But she has a sinking feeling that her son is actually telling the truth. Okay, now we're finally getting somewhere. After this encounter, the family can officially put a name to the strange activity that's been going on. It all has something to do with a girl named Rebecca. Now we as the audience know that Rebecca is the girl who drowned in the pool many years ago. Eve might not be aware of this fact just yet, but there are a few ways that she could find out. First, I'd start by asking the realtor. The laws for this are different across the country, but in the state of Minnesota where they live, although the realtor isn't required to disclose any deaths on the property, they are not legally allowed to obscure the truth if you ask. Which means that if you're buying a home, it's in your best interest to ask about stuff like this just in case. If the realtor won't talk, then she could try doing the research herself and seeing what she can turn up with a Google search, hiring a private company to look into it, or just asking around the neighborhood. In suburban communities like this, rumors spread like wildfire. A little girl mysteriously drowning and disappearing is some pretty hot gossip. So there's bound to be at least one chatty Kathy out there who would spill the tea in a second. Once she finds out the truth, that a girl named Rebecca really did die in that house, she can safely assume that this is a genuine haunting. That's not exactly comforting to know, but at least now she'll be headed in the right direction. I'd start by looking for any of Rebecca's family who are still around and seeing if that leads me anywhere. After that, the next thing to do would be to try to communicate with Rebecca and find out if there's any way that you can help make things right. But you need to be careful because there's a strong chance that we're not talking to Rebecca at all. Instead, it could be a demon using Rebecca's personality to get closer to the kids. After all, kids are more likely to let their guard down for another child because they naturally trust them. Things could get dangerous fast, so like I said before, I'd bring in some professionals. A paranormal investigator, medium, or priest should be able to help out depending on their preference. The spirit seems to appear when someone swims alone in the pool, especially at night, so they can recreate these conditions while an expert is on the scene to gather evidence. Each of these experts brings specific tools and training to the job that could help them figure out what's really going on and possibly banish the spirit if they decide that doing so is necessary. Until then, I'd make it a rule that we don't set one more foot in the pool until this is all figured out. But unfortunately, the family here isn't going to accept the truth until it's already too late. Although Eve is worried about her son, Ray here isn't nearly as concerned. He thinks that Elliot must be making things up since he's been having trouble fitting in at school and decides that what they really need to do is host a pool party where they invite everyone in town. Later that night, the parents decide to go out to dinner, telling the kids to be safe and stay in the house. Well, no sooner are they gone than Izzy here invites her new friend Ronan over for a swim and warns her brother not to say a word about it to their mom and dad. The two of them start playing Marco Polo, and while Izzy is searching for her friend, he swims to the edge and quietly sneaks out of the pool. Just then, the radio mysteriously cuts out, and the lights begin to flicker on and off. 
Peeking through her eyelashes, Izzy sees a figure rise up to the surface, but she has no idea that it's not Ronin. It silently floats there, letting her get closer and closer before suddenly disappearing beneath the surface, and then reappearing directly behind her, whispering Polo at her in a demonic voice. Still thinking that it's her friend, she dives below the surface to find him, but that's when the bloated looking creature grabs her by the ankle and tries to pull her under. Lucky for her, she's able to kick herself free, and the creature disappears back into the depths. Terrified, she jumps out of the pool saying that something tried to grab her, but Ronin swears that it wasn't him. Okay, I guess Izzy here really should have listened to her parents, but on the bright side, at least now we've got our first good look at this thing. The first thing that I'd do if I was in her place was immediately tell my parents what I saw. Her excuse for not telling them is that she doesn't want the family to have to move again. But if I saw a creature like that living in our pool, I'd consider moving far, far away to be a very viable option. Put it this way, she can either tell the truth and cause her parents some inconvenience, or continue to live in fear of a water spirit in their yard that wants to harvest their souls at any opportunity. Personally, I'd know what I'd pick. From where we've seen the creature, it appears to be some kind of bloated humanoid that prefers to live underwater. It's terrifying, but at least now we can start to figure out what it is. There are countless stories from cultures around the world that tell of water spirits similar to this, which gives us a lot to work with, but also makes it more difficult to narrow down. For example, the German Nix is a shape-shifting creature that often appears as a humanoid male and attempts to lure children into the water to drown them, which sounds pretty damn similar to what we've got going on here. The shape-shifting element even explains how that boat toy keeps appearing and then disappearing out of nowhere. It's said that the creature could be killed by calling its true name, although I have no idea how you'd go about figuring that one out. Alternatively, it could be appeased by offering it a gift of three drops of blood, an animal sacrifice, and some vodka, or throwing a small piece of steel into the water. Why that would work, I couldn't tell you, but we don't need to understand it. We just need it gone, so it's worth a try. There's also the Slavic Voidenoi, who appears as a naked old man with a face that resembles a frog's, long hair, and a body that's covered in muck and glowing eyes. Again, that sure does sound a lot like our uninvited guest here. They're known to drown people when angry and capture their souls, and locals would make sacrifices to keep them happy, which definitely fits our guy's MO. For one of these, dropping a pinch of tobacco into the water would get you on its good side, and it might even show you where to catch a few fish. Both of these creatures fit the bill, but it raises the question, what would one of these creeps be doing all the way over here in Minnesota? Instead, I'd say it's more likely that our pool spirit is a local. Native American mythology has has many examples of water spirits, both friendly and hostile, most of which are only interested in maintaining the balance between man and nature. It could be that something about this pool makes the spirit angry. An easy solution could be to simply deactivate the pump that's drawing water up from the spring and fill in the pool so that the spirit can stay underwater where it likes to be and restore the natural balance. Otherwise, you could always try luring it into a trap and killing it outright. For some reason, the the creature let Elliot go and disappeared into the drain during the day, but came out to attack Izzy at night. Perhaps this means that it's sensitive to sunlight since it lives in the underground spring. One strategy could be to put up UV lights all around the pool and then lure it out at night before activating them to see if that harms it. Of course, when all else fails, there's always good old physical violence to fall back on. We don't know yet if it can be physically hurt, but there's only one way to find out. Next time that it shows up, they could try hitting it really hard with one of their dad's baseball bats just to see what happens. It's not the ideal solution, but it might be the simplest one. With all that being said, it still seems like the easiest thing to do here would be to just stay out of the pool and move to a different house. But soon, we're going to see exactly why that is not an option. The weekend finally comes, and it's time for the pool party. But Elliot and Izzy have already decided that they aren't getting into that aquatic death trap. As for Eve, she tries to play it off like she isn't worried, but she can't shake the feeling that something terrible could happen at any minute. Outside, 
The Little League coach's son asks Ray to sign a ball that he hit at practice the day before, and Ray has the idea that they should challenge some of the neighbors to a chicken fight. Nobody realizes it yet, but this pool party is about to turn deadly. Meanwhile, back in the kitchen, Eve decides to ask the realtor why the pool has not been used for nearly 20 years before they moved in. The woman tries to dodge the question at first, but when Eve turns up the pressure, she finally admits that a young girl drowned in the pool several years back. To her, one little death is no reason to stop using a perfectly good swimming pool, and she thinks that the other family who lived there might have just been superstitious. That's when Eve asks if the girl's name was Rebecca, and the woman is absolutely shocked that she could know this. But the conversation is suddenly cut short when all hell starts to break loose outside. With the coach's kid still on his shoulders, Ray starts walking back farther and farther into the deep end, and for some reason, he's refusing to let go. Just then, a cloud of black sludge rises up from the drain pipe and goes straight into Ray's mouth causing him to become fully possessed by the spirit that's haunting the pool. With a sinister look on his face, he pulls the kid fully underwater, and nobody around seems to realize what's going on. Luckily, the kid's dad finally notices what's happening and wrestles him away just in time. Ray here is unconscious when they get him to the surface, but after a moment, he suddenly wakes up gasping for air, acting confused, as if he had no idea what he's done. The kid's family decides that they're not going to press charges, but his mother warns them never to come near her son ever again. Eve still can't believe this is happening, but now she's fully convinced that this pool is out for blood. That very same afternoon, Eve decides that it's time for them to get the hell out of there while they still have the chance, but Ray here refuses to give in. He's still convinced that the pool means no harm and swears that it's only changing their lives for the better. Still, Eve finally manages to convince him, but before they can even make it out of the driveway, Ray starts having some kind of attack and spitting up globs of black slime forcing them to take him back inside the house. Eve calls his doctor, and the woman says that they should let him rest for the weekend, but Ray won't stop desperately begging her to carry him back to the pool one last time. She's still hoping that there's something that they can do, but it won't be long before her husband is completely under the pool's control. Okay, this is not good. They still might not fully understand what's going on, but we've seen this kind of thing play out dozens of times. And it looks like Ray here is showing all the textbook signs of demonic possession. He's been isolating himself from his family to focus on his own desires getting into shouting matches with his wife over the pool, allowing his kids to do dangerous things like swim alone when she specifically told them not to, and even after he nearly drowned the neighbor's kid, he still refuses to see the danger staring at him right in the face. Besides being mentally unwell, he also gets physically ill when they try to get him away from the pool, which is something that a demonic spirit will do to prevent the victim from leaving their area of influence to get any help. Dad is in too deep to go anywhere, but that doesn't mean that everyone else has to stay and risk their lives. Since the kids can still leave the house, I'd have them go stay with a trusted family member while Eve and Ray stay behind to get to the root of the problem. By now, it's definitely time to call in some experts. First, I'd have a doctor and possibly even a mental health professional make a house visit so that we can rule out any more logical explanations for this condition, but I wouldn't stop there. They really need to get a priest to come and check the place out. Not only could they give you more information about whatever's causing this, also it is way past time to drain that pool, plug up the well, and fill the whole damn thing in so that the spring water can't keep coming up. That right there could be enough to get them on the right track again. Ray's not going to like having to give up on his dreams, but he can always get a desk job working for one of the teams once he's back in a sound state of mind and they can get him a PlayStation with a copy of MLB The Show for whenever he wants to relive those glory days. That game is pretty fun, not gonna lie. While Ray is recovering, Eve decides that it's time to take matters into her own hands, and she starts by draining all of the water out of the pool. The next day, she starts digging a bit deeper, and that's when she makes a shocking discovery. Rebecca isn't the only one who went missing. Going all the way back to the 1900s, several other people who lived there mysteriously disappeared one day, and none of them were ever found. The evidence is beginning to stack up, but there's still one more person who she needs to talk to. 
Rebecca's mother, Kay, who still lives there in town. Eve later arrives at the family's rundown mansion, and the woman invites her to come inside. At first, she refuses to even acknowledge the fact that she ever had a daughter, but she eventually admits the truth when Eve tells her what's been happening to her family. In the years since they lost Rebecca, her terminally ill son Thomas somehow made a miraculous recovery and went on to having an incredibly successful career as a US ambassador. The truth is that this was no accident, and the woman here made a deadly bargain that came with a terrible price. She explains how it works in terms of a wish well, saying that some water holds magical powers that can answer your prayers and grant you your deepest desires. In order to receive the water's gift, you also have to pay the price, and what it wants is an innocent life. It turns out that Kay here willingly sacrificed her own daughter so that her son would be healed, ignoring the girl's screams as she watched her drown on that night all those years ago. Terrified, Eve asks her what she can do to stop this, but just when the woman is about to give her answer, she begins coughing up the same black slime as her husband. With the sludge pouring out from her eyes and nose, she begins mocking Eve in a demonic voice, saying that when it's done with her family, it will only find another to repeat the cycle. Eve takes this as her cue to leave and quickly grabs her bag before sprinting for the door. Okay, this lady sucks. Now we know what really happened to poor Rebecca. Her own mother sacrificed her so that her brother would be healed. I know every parent has their favorite child, even if they won't admit it, but damn, this is just wrong. Now, there's something interesting that Eve might have noticed here. The woman has a water fountain in her house that seems to be connected to the spring which means that their pool isn't the only place in town where this evil water reaches the surface. Knowing this, perhaps Eve could get geological survey data from a logical environmental agency to find the source, and then destroy the original spring that's causing all of this by either caving it in somehow or drying it up. She also learned that the pool gives you your deepest desire in exchange for a sacrifice, which means that maybe Eve here could find some way to become infected herself and then use her husband as a sacrifice to keep her kids safe. Before resorting to that though, there's one other idea that I might try. When they were trying to leave the house a little while ago, it seemed like Ray here was the only one who had any kind of negative reaction. This should mean that Eve and the kids are all free to go. So why not just leave while they still can? At this point, you have to do what's best for the majority of the family. So leaving Ray to figure it out himself is a totally fair choice. And it might be their only choice if they want to avoid any trouble. If it were me, I'd take the kids and get everyone somewhere safe before the situation gets any worse. Rushing home, Eve tries to call her husband, but her phone was covered with water back at the woman's house, and now she can't get it working. At the same time, the pool begins to fill with the black sludge once again. While Ray here is taking a shower, he's suddenly possessed by the demonic spirit, and now it's ready to make its final move. The kids arrive back at the house later that night, but they can't find either of their parents anywhere. While Izzy goes to look around, Elliot pours himself a glass of water and notices that it's strangely rippling with no logical reason why. Just then, Elliot hears their cat meowing from somewhere in the backyard and decides to check it out. As he does, the glass of water starts sliding towards the edge of the counter until it tips over and shatters on the kitchen floor. Outside, Elliot thinks that he sees the cat hiding out on a flamingo raft that's floating in the middle of the pool. Trying to get closer, he crawls out to the very end of the diving board, but when he spins the raft around, the demonic creature lunges at him from the other side, scaring him so badly that he loses his balance and crashes into the water. Okay, Elliot, buddy, what are you doing here, man? After everything that's happened, you think that you would have figured out by now to stay the hell away from that pool no matter what. I hate to say it, but Elliot, <laughs> you f***ed up, man. We'll keep this one short because honestly, you practically have to be trying to die to end up in a position like this. I mean, did you somehow forget about the Sasquatch looking abomination that's living in the pipes? You barely got away from that thing the last time. But now, when it's the most powerful that it's ever been, you decide to throw all of your survival instincts straight out the window. <laughs> Get it together, Elliot! I'm sorry that I gotta be the one to tell you this, but Cider is gone with a capital G. 
and you're about to be next. So far, this pool has already tried to kill you and everyone in your family, plus a kid from your baseball team and even the damn pool guy. That's not to mention that you've literally spoken to the ghost of the last kid who lived there, but somehow you still just fell for the most obvious trap of all time. Hopefully you'll learn your lesson if you make it out of this alive. But for now, there's only one thing left to say. Elliot, you f***ed up, man. As soon as it has him, the creature starts closing the pool cover, trying to trap him underneath. Realizing what's happening, his sister runs and tries to hold it back, but she isn't strong enough. Luckily, their mother shows up just in time, and they're able to temporarily overpower the spirit by working together. With the cover jammed, Eve jumps into the water to rescue her son, and Izzy runs inside to call for help. But she ends up slipping and slicing her hand on a piece of broken glass. She's injured, but otherwise alright, so she grabs her phone to call for help. But all of a sudden, her possessed dad appears from the shadows and smacks the phone out of her hands before sending her flying across the room. There's nowhere for her to run. Run. But instead of killing her, Ray locks her in the garage while he goes to deal with her brother. Refusing to give up, Izzy waits until he's gone before quietly grabbing his baseball bat from the wall. Meanwhile, at the bottom of the pool, Eve finds that the drain has opened up into some kind of underworld. Thinking quickly, she returns to the surface to grab one end of a garden hose and a flashlight before diving straight back in. Using the garden hose to take a deep breath, she plunges forward into the bottomless abyss. Deep below the surface, she finds her son slowly drifting farther towards the bottom. She makes it to him just in time and begins swimming for their lives back towards the surface. But as she does, the lost souls of the pool rise up from the darkness and start trying to drag them both back into the void. They're coming at her from all sides, but Eve finally manages to get away, or at least that's what she thinks. Looking around, she's horrified to realize that she's completely lost with no way to tell which way is up. Another spirit appears, but this time it's the young girl Rebecca, and she's there to help. Pulling out a quarter, she drops it into the water and lets it sink towards the bottom, showing Eve the way back up. With the other spirits closing in, she makes it to the surface just in time, but they aren't safe just yet. Ray appears behind them, saying that it's already too late. He lifts her high up into the air with one arm, ready to kill her too, but at the last second, Izzy sneaks up behind him with the bat and blasts him in the knee. As she hits him over and over again, she literally knocks the sense back into him, and he coughs up a huge puddle of black vomit finally free from the water's spell. They start carrying Elliot to the car so that they can get him to the hospital, but before they can make it out of the yard, he starts coughing up the same black slime, and that's when Ray realizes what he has to do. Turning around, he takes one last look at his family before diving in the pool and disappearing into the darkness without a trace, sacrificing himself so that his son can live. The plan works, but Ray is never seen again. As the days go on, the family considers selling the house, but they realize that doing so would just cause the cycle to repeat again. Instead, they decide to stay and fill the pool in with dirt so that no other families have to suffer. In the end, they ended up learning the most important lesson of all. Next time they're looking for a fun way to cool off at home, they should try getting a slip and slide instead. Pools! They're great and all, but I know two things about pools that I'd like to share with you guys. You can swim in them and you can die in them. So I'm not going in a pool if I see some creepy shit going on around in it, you know? They tell kids not to run around the pool. How about don't go near the pool if some freaky shit is going on? Drain that mother and fill it up with dirt. I also happen to know from buying a house that pools do not increase the value of the property itself. So screw that pool. You don't need that pool. And if they paid extra for the house because of that pool, that family is some damn fools. But let me know down in the comments what you would do in this situation. Leave a like and subscribe and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. Shout out to our editors and our writers for making this show happen. And you guys, the audience, for being so damn cool. I'm gonna f with you guys on the next one. Have a damn good day.